So uh, we we just talked about the composition actually uh, in terms of felsic, uh, felsic and uh, mafic uh, terminology. Uh, there you should be able to um, uh, you should be able to uh, figure out uh, their compositions as well as their uh, their nature. I mean, uh, whether they are volcanic or plutonic. I mean, in terms of uh, the texture, in terms of uh, texture. Once you are heard uh, about the rock name, you should know whether it is volcanic or plutonic. Whether it is uh, crystallized at the interior or crystallized and uh, crystallized at the uh, exterior. Okay, volcanic or plutonic. So remember about their mineral assemblage uh, and uh, the deficiency or richness with respect to quartz. So this is uh, this is important. <clears throat> okay, now uh, we will uh, straight away move to the composition of the mantle because uh, we already learned about the ultramafic composition. So the mantle. Uh, our mental composition uh, is ultramafic. Okay, so in the previous diagram that I showed, here you can see uh, the the uh, the nature of the mantle. Uh, there uh, we know uh, mental convection is going on, right? That means uh, uh, the the magma is moving uh, with uh, giving uh, with exerting a tremendous force beneath the. Uh, tectonic plates, right? So this mantle convection drives everything. They drive all these tectonic uh, situations because of this plate motion, right? So even uh, even for partial melting, even for melting taking place uh, to generate magma, uh, this mantle convection can contributes, right? So this magma br brings up material from depth to the uh, shallow regions. And at the shallow regions, what happens is uh, this mantle, which is coming uh, up, uh, tend to melt partially. Right from there onwards, only you will see the droplets of magma uh, forming. Right, so you don't you don't see any uh, kind of uh, magma generation at deep uh, regions like here. But when it comes to shallow region, then uh, pressure has dropped a lot uh, compared to uh, the deeper situation and therefore we call decompressional melting is taking place okay decompressional melting means melting uh, horizon as a result of pressure decrease pressure decrease uh, is also a factor to cause melting that you have to remember right this is the main reason for mental melting uh, we call the man we call uh, the magma parcel or the mantle parcel right uh, 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 some kind of uh, uh, ultramafic material which is coming up as a result of uh, this mantle uh, convection faces uh, some reduced pressure uh, at the shallow level so that causes uh, that particular mantle material to melt because you know there is no big uh, temperature gap here i mean nobody is going to heat this magma parcel at this point here now you have uh, magma like uh, say 900 or 1000 degrees celsius and when it comes even shallow level you might uh, get reduced the temperature rather than getting heated because you are coming up to the shallow levels but at the same time, what is happening is uh, you get reduce the pressure also, right? So to heat or oh, sorry uh, to melt a mantle material, uh, one thing you can do is increase the temperature. I mean, you have you can heat. Uh, for 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 example, here this magma. Uh, uh, so sorry, the the mantle material here. If you make this uh, plume, which is coming from the low uh, lower mantle. Right, crust man, uh, crow mantle region because it is a very hot magma. I said, in any case, if you want, if you are able to uh, attack uh, this mantle region here, then you are attacking with very high heat. 
right? Then you can uh, melt that magma here, uh, that, uh, that mantle here, producing new magma, right? That is uh, obvious because uh, wherever you heat, it will melt, the material will melt. But when the material is coming to the shallow level, nobody is going to heat you, but instead uh, you are dropping the temperature slightly because of shallowness. But at the same time, what is happening is you are dropping the pressure also. That means you are suddenly decom uh, decompressing the mental material that can also uh, cause melting. So that is what we have always within this setting, this mid-ocean rich region, decompressional melting. That is very common in this region. So that's why we call this region as the melting region. This region we call the melting region. Uh, because of this decompression. Uh, the mantle material which was not caught by this decompressional melting region will uh, travel uh, with this convection because you have the mantle convection uh, cell like this and this material will, will be going uh, in, uh, to this region and finally it will go back to a deep mantle region. Right? That is what we call the recycling recycling of the mantle because uh, uh, the mantle which was uh, uh, uplifted or uh, moved upward, uh, part of it might be subjected to decompression or melting, part of that, part, uh, another part might be uh, recycling back to the mantle, right? This is a cyclic process. So this, is, this happens always uh, within the uh, upper mantle region. So upper mantle region is very, very rigorous. Uh, that means a lot of melting is taking place uh, in that uh, upper mantle region. Okay, so decompressional melting is the main melting uh, process taking place in the upper mantle region. And here uh, there is no decompressional melting because this is uh, just uh, me uh, melting by increasing uh, temperature. Right? So that means heating, frictional heat is there. Ample amount of frictional heat is available here in this region because of this uh, huge slab uh, subduction. Right? It uh, rubs over the other uh, slab so that uh, you have a lot of uh, frictional heat is generated. So the melting is caused by heating here. Right? It is heating uh, generated magma, but here, not heated magma, heating generated magma, it is decompressional melting magma is coming as the mob mid ocean rich basalts. But in uh, most of uh, the cases uh, where uh, these uh, subduction plates convergence, uh, you have a lot of frictional heat. That frictional heat uh, introduces uh, the magma uh, to generate. In a rift system, somewhere here, uh, again, you have uh, the decompressional melting. Uh, within this region because uh, there also you have the divergence and remember here also you have the divergence and the uh, divergence you have here also that means there is a possibility for decompression the pressure decrease when the mantle material coming up to the shallow levels okay so decompression and melting can be taken place at divergent uh, boundaries or divergent zones uh, whereas at convergent plates or uh, convergent uh, settings, uh, what you have is uh, heated, I mean, uh, heating uh, dominated magmas, uh, frictional heating mainly. Okay, so this is how the magma is uh, taking place. But uh, in the hotspot region, uh, where you have the mantle plume, it's already hot, very hot. So that mantle plume can make all the areas here to be melted, okay? But mainly this magma is a voluminous uh, amount of magma is coming up and that will dump uh, on the ocean as uh, uh, ocean island uh, vessels. We call ocean island vessels, OIBs here. Uh, the mantle plume generated vessels are called OIBs, ocean island vessels. Here you remember mob, mid-ocean rich vessels, right? But here it's ocean island vessels. So OIBs are very different from uh, MORBs, mobs, uh, geochemically, 
their composition is entirely different uh, because uh, you have, uh, you know, it's coming from very deep region of the mantle. And also you remember the in the deep region of the mantle, what you have in the co-mantle region. I mentioned these subducting slabs, these subducting slabs, what happens at the end? They will break somewhere, they will break and uh, the remaining uh, broken slab will come back to some extent, right? Bounce back to some extent to maintain the isostasy. Whereas uh, the, the broken, uh, the remaining slab, the other part will subduct. It goes down uh, deep and deep, right? While it is going down, it can, uh, sub it can be subjected to melting, further melting, and it can be uh, some unmelted portions will be uh, deposited in uh, the core mantle regions like here, right? There can be a lot of uh, su subducted slabs, uh, parts of them deposited there, unmelted, right? Sometimes they can be melted, sometimes they can be uh, deposited as modified slabs, right? Its composition may be entirely different now compared to what you uh, observed uh, in uh, this subducting uh, <clears throat> situation. So these uh, these slabs can remelt, and uh, I mean uh, they can accumulate there, and uh, at a certain time they can remelt, and they will come up as a huge batch of ma uh, magma uh, as a mantle plume, right? So they come as a mantle plume, a huge uh, magma flow. That's why they come as a hot uh, magma and also a uh, very voluminous amount of uh, magma is uh, coming up uh, and it will finally dump at the ocean floors, uh, generating a new uh, type of uh, material, ocean island basalts. Okay. Right. So uh, let's go back to the uh, composition of the mantle. Uh, we, we mentioned that the composition of the mantle uh, is uh, ultramafic. So you have the ultramafic and this ultramafic mantle is called lersolite composition. Okay, lersolite composition. Lersolite composition means uh, you have uh, pyroxene, you have olivine, you have OPX. All these uh, uh, minerals are there in the lersolite composition. So normally uh, where we get this uh, uh, lersolite uh, as evidence material, uh, the mental material, uh, we can find, because the mantle is deep, we can't have a drilling program to bring up the mantle, right? Mental material. We can have uh, continental material. We can have granites anytime, any, uh, any, anywhere uh, on the continents. We can drill and bring them to the surface. But to the reached, uh, reaching the mantle is very, very hard. You can't reach uh, into the mantle because it's uh, deep and we don't have mechanisms uh, to reach that uh, depth. But in the nature, we have uh, several places uh, where, uh, uh, where this mantle is exposed. Right? Ophiolite is one place, one such place. Uh, you, I think you know Ophiolites. Uh, you may have learned about Ophiolites uh, during your first year course uh, when you learned about the plate tectonics. Uh, we, 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 we know uh, normally what happens in plate tectonics is the heavier slab uh, goes down, right? The heavier one goes down. But uh, there are some situations instead of going down, I mean, instead of subducting, this slab can uh, due to some uh, disturbances here, uh, they can come up to the uh, continental plate, right? Instead of going down, it can uh, bend and uh, come up to the uh, continental plate, right? Or oceanic plate, even here. It, instead of going down, it can come up to the oceanic plate like here, right? We call such a uh, situation as obduction. It's not subduction, it's obduction, right? So normally uh, what, is, uh, what should happen is uh, subduction, but uh, without subducting, sometimes uh, some slabs, oceanic slabs, uh, 
uh, they go abduction. So when it is uh, gone abduction, what happens is uh, the mantle, upper mantle available here in this region, they will tend to come up to uh, this region. I mean, it's like extrusion. We call it extrusion, mantle extrusion, right? So these mantle materials are coming up extruded because uh, you have some disturbance here to subduction uh, so that uh, you have uh, created kind of a window here right some uh, some uh, we uh, some uh, free zone so through that this magma will come up, uh, come up this ultramafic magma will come up so there uh, you have uh, ophiolite generation so we call uh, this type of a setting uh, as the ophiolite uh, formation setting right so such ophiolites uh, actually uh, uh, slabs of oceanic crust and upper mantle. So we, we saw that uh, oceanic crust is abducted and upper mantle is extruding into the zone. Right? So we call abducted uh, materials uh, at the edge of continent at uh, con convergent uh, zones. So at the convergent zone, we saw uh, these mantle materials uh, are coming uh, intruded uh, into the abducted uh, zone. So they are you can find mantle materials, right? Because that is shallow. Uh, so you can uh, directly sample them. One example is Oman, right? Yeah. Oman, uh, there are uh, huge uh, uh, ophiolites uh, deposited. I mean, uh, not deposited, it's abducted. Uh, and uh, you have a lot of uh, mountain-like uh, features uh, made of uh, these uh, mantle materials. That is uh, what we call the ophiolite. Oman ophiolite is a very famous uh, abducted uh, mantle, uh, abducted area where you can find uh, mantle materials. In addition to that, uh, we can have uh, some dredge, uh, dredge samples from oceanic fracture zones. Of course, uh, when you have some fractures, uh, you you are like uh, making a dredge. Uh, you are making like uh, some. Uh, some zones of uh, uh, some windows into the deeper mantle, right? For example, if you have some fractures here, oceanic fracture zones here, through these fractures, you can dredge, you can uh, drill to uh, further down. Actually, uh, this is already uh, automatically drilled like dredge uh, this, uh, this area because of fracturing. So that means you have the access to more deeper level and from there onwards, you can start drilling. Because uh, to these uh, to these uh, fracture zones, uh, like in the previous case, uh, uh, some mantle material have already come up, right? So you can dredge, uh, you can drill some uh, portion, but not up to the mantle. You can't drill up to the mantle, but you can drill up to uh, the place uh, where these uh, uh, these extruded materials are available along these fractures. Right? So such places uh, we can have. Uh, mental material uh, within the oceanic fracture zones, right? So that is also one uh, situation where we can get mental materials. In addition, uh, we have further uh, mental material exposed on the surface, we call orogenic massives. Orogenic massives, or in other words, uh, there is another term, uh, another term uh, we call alpine type massives, right? These are some kind of uh, uh, mental materials uh, they have uh, come up at uh, mostly at subduction zones, right? So at subduction zones, some uh, some mental materials have extruded uh, into the continent, not like uh, ophiolite, but uh, directly they have emplaced on the uh, continental crust, right? So uh, sometimes they make some mountains like this. Okay, so that's why we call them orogenic uh, massives. Uh, Alpine uh, Alps region is uh, one example for that. And uh, in Italy, uh, there is uh, something called uh, Lenzo, uh, Lenzo massive, uh, an example for mantle. Uh, uh, I mean, a mountain composed fully of mantle materials. And in France, uh, there is less, uh, less. Uh, this term lersolite is also coming from that uh, less massive in uh, France, right? Less uh, lersolite means the mantle material, right? Uh, so the uh, maybe uh, 
uh, first mental material uh, discovered from Lerz area, probably. So they termed the, that particular mantle as Lerzolite. I, I exactly don't know uh, about the history of that, but anyway, Lerz is a massive, uh, that is a uh, mantle segment uh, found as a uh, kind of a mountain, right? Uh, Lerz and also uh, Lanzo in Italy, uh, similar type of uh, mantle material. And also in Japan, uh, there is uh, a similar type of uh, massif. It's called uh, Horoman, uh, Horoman periodite uh, massif. So all these are periodite massifs, mantle materials. Uh, they have extruded into the uh, continent, uh, which is different from Ophiolite because in Ophiolite, you have other rock types also. For example, basalts, gabbros, uh, some uh, other oceanic components are there. But in orogenic periodite massifs, you have the uh, periodite itself without uh, other sequences of gabbros or anything. But of sorry, uh, gabbro can be there, but not uh, uh, not as a sequence. So in an ophiolite sequence, there are some typical uh, rock types and some uh, typical rock sequence that you can find. Even pillow lavas can be found. Uh, you know, lava uh, which uh, crystallizes like a pillow that is called pillow lava, right? So you have pillow lava, then uh, gabbro, uh, then pedrotite. Uh, likewise, uh, some sequences there uh, in an ophiolite uh, uh, setting. We will discuss about ophiolites later uh, in detail, uh, not now, right? But in alpine type pedrotites or uh, pedrotite massives, uh, you don't see this type of uh, uh, sequence of rocks. You have just uh, Periodite, and you might have some gabbros because uh, you know uh, the upper mantle and crust uh, in the crust mantle region. Here, what we uh, term uh, as uh, what is the uh, sorry, I forgot uh, what is the term the the boundary layer between crust and mantle. Remind me. Moho, remember? Moho, M-O-H-O, Moho, right? This Moho contains a lot of gabbros in this uh, Moho boundary. You have a lot of gabbros, right? So that gabbro can be available with these uh, periodites, but no pillow lava, so uh, other uh, rock types available, okay? So those are two things anyway, uh, just uh, keep in mind. So orogenic massives or alpine type massives. Uh, this is called alpine type because in Alps region, uh, this was uh, also recognized. So that's why uh, we call alpine type uh, ultramafic complexes. In addition, uh, we have uh, very popular, I mean, uh, people know much about mantle from these, that is xenoliths, because xenoliths are available globally, right? Uh, these orogenic massives or uh, ophiolites are available in only limited areas. But uh, xenoliths are available in many places around the globe uh, because uh, xenolith means uh, the entrapped mantle portions uh, came out with uh, basalt or uh, other volcanic uh, rock types. So that means uh, you have uh, uh, basalt, for example, coming out to the surface and which when come from the deeper parts, they, uh, they bring some fragments of rocks. These fragments of rocks are mantle rocks, periodites. They are available inside the uh, magma. So these are called xenoliths. So if you see any uh, rock fragment available in a very fine-grained basalt, because you know the basalt is very fine-grained, you can't distinguish the mineral grains. But in that such a background, such a ground mass, uh, if you have coarse-grained material, very greenish, uh, olivine, pyroxene-like bearing, uh, material that is the mantle uh, original mag mantle rocks coming out from the uh, interior right so uh, so trapped uh, mantle rocks are uh, called xenoliths so these are the xenoliths or nodules sometimes you can call nodules right because they are fragmented uh, these uh, nodules are taken up uh, by uh, basalts when they are coming out from the earth's interior that is very uh, popular, but uh, the dis disadvantage here is they are very small. They are tiny, some centimeter scale, mostly, right? So you don't have enough uh, 
uh, amounts of samples to study study about the mental there yeah. but uh, orogenic pedotides or ophiolites or these dredged samples uh, you have a lot of uh, material right large uh, large uh, fragments i mean orogenic massifs means they are mountains right so you have huge materials to study about the mantle and uh, i forgot to mention you uh, these uh, dredge samples from ocean fracture zones are also called abyssal pedrotites okay abyssal pedrotites because they are dredged from the ocean floor right uh, they are dredged they are recovered from the ocean floor uh, that means uh, abyssal area here in the ocean so therefore they are called abyssal pedrotites also right remember uh, they are called abyssal pedrotites uh, <clears throat> so uh, this is uh, one uh, another type xenoliths uh, there are some uh, small scale some sm uh, millimeter scale sometimes or centimeter scale right very rarely you might find some 10 or 15 10 centimeter size or hand specimen size uh, xenoliths but very rare but if you found it that will be very very precious okay we have another type that is kimberlite xenoliths. Kimberlites, you know, it's also uh, kind of a magma, uh, deep magma. They are also coming from very deep, but not like uh, the mantle plumes, uh, which is coming from cross mantle boundary, uh, sorry, co core mantle boundary. Uh, these kimberlites are also coming from lower mantle, deeper mantle, uh, but uh, not as deep as uh, the mantle plumes, right? Uh, most of uh, these kimberlites are bringing up uh, diamonds, diamond grains, because uh, being they are deep, uh, the very uh, very deep regions, carbon can uh, stay as diamond. You know that, right? Uh, organic materials can be converted into graphite. That you know already in our condolites, we have graphite, right? Converted uh, organic materials. But if those uh, materials are going down further and further, uh, they can uh, convert into diamond more than 100 kilometers should uh, go down so such deep magma can bring up some diamonds also such uh, such uh, magma is called kimberlites right so these kimberlite magma uh, can also bring xenoliths similar xenoliths like uh, the basolith basalts uh, but in the case of basalts they are coming from very shallow regions like upper mantle but uh, kimberlites are coming further down. So that means uh, such xenoliths can bring more deeper mantle. So here we have shallow mantle uh, composition. We can learn from basalts. Uh, I mean, uh, the xenoliths brought by basalts. But xenoliths brought by kimberlites, you can uh, study about more uh, about lower mantle. Right? That is an advantage. OK, so this kimberlite means pipe-like intrusions quickly intruded from the deep mantle carrying numerous xenoliths. Okay. Uh, only difference is they are coming from a more deeper region of the mantle. Okay, so do you have any question with respect to this content? We have already discussed. Okay, right. So just keep in mind their composition. Uh, we, uh, I mean, uh, we are. We can learn about the mantle composition from any any type of these uh, samples, but uh, there are advantages and disadvantages with respect to uh, each setting. Mm. One prominent disadvantage I will mention you about uh, the basalts, uh, the xenoliths coming from uh, with the basalts because of this basalt, they are coming uh, some at very different uh, uh, rates. I mean the speeds, velocities, right? Uh, during the ascent, maybe it takes some millions of years to come up to the surface. But during that time, this uh, mantle rock, this periodite, can interact with this uh, basalt fluid uh, or melt, because this is a melt, right? So when this uh, uh, mantle segment is there, uh, the, the in, a, in, a, in a liquid, right, uh, of basalt, uh, with respect to uh, various pressure temperature changes during the ascent, right? And also it takes a long period of time to come up, right? It's, this is not a few seconds uh, thing, right? It takes millions of years. During this time span, 
the basalt composition also varies because basalt itself fractionates, as you can remember. Basalt can fractionate minerals, right? Various minerals. So uh, it changes its composition. So the the periodite material uh, dipped in this basalt always face some changing composition uh, of its surrounding. So uh, there can be some uh, instances where uh, they are no longer stable. So that uh, the periodite can start reaction with the uh, basaltic changing or evolving basaltic composition. So that when it comes to the surface, you are not getting an ideal mantle material. You are getting a modified mantle material, right? Because of this interaction. So that is a uh, disadvantage because uh, you, you never know what has happened uh, on the way. Of course, there can be un unaltered or unreacted portions, but uh, there are a lot of reacted portions where uh, you see a lot of uh, compositional changes, especially uh, isotopic changes uh, matters uh, because uh, we, we cannot uh, reverse them at all. Uh, so we can't uh, understand uh, what was the pristine uh, or was, what, what was the uh, original or initial uh, isotopic composition. So that is a disadvantage. So out of that, uh, ophiolites and uh, uh, orogenic periodites may be advantages to study. But uh, again, ophiolite has, a, uh, I mean, uh, with respect to all wall rock reactions compared to xenoliths. But ophiolite have, again, another disadvantage, although they are, uh, we can find them in massive sizes, uh, ophiolites are always related with oceanic setting, right? So in the ocean, uh, oceanic setting, you have a lot of uh, hydrothermal liquids and uh, oceanic uh, water, everything. They also uh, cause uh, these ophiolites to uh, weather, weather and a uh, lot of reactions. Again, they can be modified also, right? So that is a problem. Actually, the oceanic or these abyssal periodites, uh, we have uh, various uh, difficulties in uh, getting precise data. Uh, because uh, they are altered, they are uh, changed. A lot of uh, uh, isotopic compositions are similar to seawater isotopic composition. So it's a problem. It does not give the mantle isotopic composition because of these problems. Of course, there are pristine areas, I mean, alt unaltered areas, but uh, this uh, can uh, give us a uh, problem. Okay. Uh, but compared to both of those, uh, these uh, alpine massives are better because they are not sub, uh, supposed to have any interaction because they are within the continent itself. But uh, at the margins or along the boundaries, there may be some uh, interactions. But uh, we, within the uh, body, uh, because they are also very huge kilometer scale bodies, so we can uh, mostly find the uh, pristine uh, mantle composition, the, the original mantle composition. So that is uh, very advantageous uh, with respect to all other types of settings. Kimberlites are also same. Uh, wall rock reaction can take place. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> uh, for the mantle composition, uh, whatever the setting, uh, if you have the pristine mantle composition, it should be a Lursolite composition. The, the, the average mantle composition is lursolite. So this green area represents the lursolite composition in this triangle. Uh, you can see this triangle is made up of uh, olivine, orthopyroxene, and clinopyroxene because those are the three minerals you can find in the mantle, right? So any mantle rock should contain olivine, orthopyroxene, and clinopyroxene. Okay. Right. So uh, this uh, triangular diagram, we can divide into two uh, portions. Actually, this triangular diagram is not given not just for the mantle rock. It's given for ultramafic rock because ultramafic rocks can be found even in the crust also, right? Not necessarily uh, in the mantle alone, right? Because, uh, you know, a uh, lot of pyroxene-rich rocks are found in, uh, in, uh, in the crustal regions. So a lot of pyroxene-rich means they are uh, very less amount of silica. So that means they are not mafic, they are ultramafic again. So uh, such rocks are called pyroxenites. Those are called pyroxenites. Uh, these pyroxenites are available in the mantle also, but 
within the crust also. But pyruvides, we don't have them uh, forming in the uh, crustal region. It is only in the mantle. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, this diagram is giving overall ultramafic composition. So we can divide it into two based on uh, the mineralogical composition, uh, pyroxenides and pyruvides. Okay, Pyro pyroxenides means a lot of pyroxene, either orthopyroxene or clinopyroxene. This is the 100 uh, for pyroxene, this and this orthopyroxene 100. So up to 40% here, up to 40% of, 40% uh, uh, of olivine, right? This is the olivine uh, count. Olivine 100 is here, okay? Olivine 100 here, 90, 80, 70, 40, uh, 70, 60, 50, and 40. When it comes to here, you have olivine 40%. So olivine 40% means the rest of the 60% is composed of orthopyroxine and clinopyroxine. So that means uh, it's a pyroxine rich rock. So that's why we call it pyroxenite. Okay, that's the pyroxenite composition. But when it's uh, opposite, that means uh, your rock contains uh, about 60% of olivine. 60% of olivine, the rest is pyroxene. The rest 40% is pyroxene, either autopyroxene or clinopyroxene. Then your predominant mineral is olivine, so uh, you can call it peridotite. Okay, so this, this particular peridotite, commonly you call as uh, lersolite. The composition, you call it uh, lersolite. Remember in lersolite, essentially, Olivine should be above 60%. Okay. Olivine should be above 60%. So, this is a common mantle composition, uh, uh, lersolite composition, but there are extreme compositions also in uh, the mantle. Uh, because, uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you can remember the melting region in the mantle, right? In the melting region, I said uh, partial melting is taking place. So, this partial melting can take place at various degrees, at variable degrees, right? 1% uh, of melting, 2%, 3%, 10%, 15, 20, 30, like uh, melting can take place. That means the entire mantle, uh, that is 100%, you take it as 100% of lazulite composition. Out of that, only very little amount of melting take place uh, and produce melt as basalt, right? So from, uh, from the lazulite mantle, uh, original mantle, you can produce basalt, okay? And once you produce basalt, uh, you have a residual mantle remaining, okay? Residual mantle, that means already uh, melted. The melt is already contributed uh, from that particular mantle. Originally, you had the mantle, unmelted, pristine uh, mantle, right? So that, uh, say you heat or you make it pressure dropped. I said two, uh, two types of melting uh, mechanisms are there. One is uh, heating that you all know. If you heat a material, it will get melted, right? But without melting, you can make it or you can drop it into a low pressure region. And there also, because of decompression, melting can initiate. Right. So whatever the way, it doesn't matter uh, if any melt is uh, produced out from this uh, mantle. Right. It can contribute. I mean, we call it uh, already uh, molten mantle. Right. So this uh, more uh, melted uh, material will be going out as a basalt. Right. It, initially, it will uh, it will form as a drop, and gradually. Little by little, these drops will accumulate and uh, forms a pipe-like uh, basaltic uh, conduit. So uh, after melting, what you have is uh, you have a residual mantle. So this residual mantle is different from this uh, original mantle because it's uh, already uh, melt has escaped, right? Some composition has gone. But uh, remember this melting process uh, first, uh, during melting, uh, compared to olivine and orthopyroxene, clinopyroxene will start melting first. That is uh, normally uh, happening in the mantle. Right? So CPX starts to melt first. So in the residual mantle, uh, uh, 
uh, obviously you should get less CPX composition, right? You have olivine OPX, but less uh, olive, uh, CPX composition. But it doesn't mean that olivine and OPX do, uh, do not melt. They also melt, but relative to CPX, they melt a uh, little, okay? Uh, so uh, here you are enriching your olivine, uh, your olivine and uh, orthopyroxene content here because uh, some of the CPX has already gone. Some of the CPX gone means uh, your concentration of olivine and uh, OPX will increase. Okay. So uh, what happens? So where is your CPX in this triangle? Here. Uh, you have CPX here. So if you are re reducing CPX means your composition of your rock will go either this way, that means towards orthopyroxine increase direction or towards uh, olivine increase in direction, right? But you know, olivine and orthopyroxine also melts to some extent, but with respect to which melts uh, much, uh, this uh, compositional direction is determined. If a lot of uh, OPX is also, uh, melted then your rock will turn into a direction like this right because olivine is getting enriched more and more olivine is there right you will remain with a lot of olivine compared to previous situation right because orthopyroxine and clinopyroxine both have gone but if olivine is uh, gone much then you are uh, you are going towards a direction like this right I am talking about this triangle, okay? In this triangle. So if in this triangle, if you are moving towards olivine direction, then uh, you are remained, this residual mantle will turn into more or less uh, olivine rich rock, right? Olivine rich rock means you are uh, turning it more towards dunite, okay? You are turning it more towards dunite. Otherwise, that means if you are uh, turning, I mean, if you are moving in a direction like this, that means uh, enriching orthopyroxine, then you are uh, making your rock into a uh, orthopyroxine rich rock, something called Harzbergite. Okay. So in a Harzbergite, remember, clinopyroxine is very limited, uh, orthopyroxine is rich. And danite, uh, sorry, uh, olivine is also there anyway, to some extent. Uh, uh, that rock is called Hasbergite. But in a danite case here, you are reducing a lot of orthopyroxine as well as clinopyroxine. So that means your rock is mostly rich in olivine. So it's mostly uh, olivine rich rock, that is danite, right? So this residual mantle or the residual rock uh, can be converted into a dunite or Hasbergite. So this is Hasbergite. Remember, H A R is it? B U R G I T E. Hasbergite. Okay. So the uh, the residual mantle can be turned into a Hasbergite or a dunite if extreme melting is taking place. So I'm talking about the extreme melting because uh, it's almost now rich in uh, olivine in the case of a dunite. If uh, it is mostly enriched in orthopyroxine author side. Orthopyroxine, this is uh, 90, right? See, this is the 90 orthopyroxine line. That is rich in uh, OPX. So then we call it Hasbergite. That is the extreme case. But in between, in between to this Hasbergite and Danite situation, uh, maybe you are here, like here. So they are, that means uh, somewhere in between here, still lazulite composition, because lazulite composition is broad, right? If you melt only a little bit of clinopyroxene, you are still uh, lazulite, right? You are not changing lazulite, but only you are changing a model percentage of uh, mineral. Clinopyroxene is reducing, but still lazulite composition. Unlike uh, extreme uh, cases like uh, what you mentioned about Hasbergite or Danite, okay? So lazulite composition, remember, you can't fix the composition, right? Because uh, depending on uh, the melting degree and uh, melting amount, uh, there will be a lot of uh, changes happening, but still uh, within the lazulite composition itself. 
So when it extreme melting is go, uh, happening, uh, it can convert into Hasbergite or it can convert into Danite. So likewise, the mantle composition can be uh, changing based on uh, the melting degree, right? So melting degree might be 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, like that. It can increase more and more. So more and more melting means uh, you are more and uh, you are consuming more and more clinopyroxene first, right? More and more clinopyroxene uh, consumed, and at the same time, if you consume orthopyroxene also, uh, it will uh, change drastically your lazulite composition, right? So if you are not consuming uh, orthopyroxene much, but you are consuming a lot of clinopyroxene, then your compositional trend will be this way. And if you are not consuming a lot of uh, orthopyroxene, but a uh, lot of uh, clinopyroxene, uh, then your trend will, I mean, uh, sorry, if you are co uh, contributing a lot of orthopyroxene, but not olivine, then your trend will be like this. Okay. So Hasbergite trend and Danite trend, two trends can be there. And at the same time, if you are contributing both to the melt, uh, CPX and OPX, both, then your composition will definitely go again towards up, right? Towards olivine direction, right? So this uh, lazulite uh, composition will getting more and more enriched in olivine and uh, more and more depleted with clinopyroxene. Even your rock stayed here, here or here, still it's uh, uh, lazulite, right? But the mineralogical abundances will be different. That is the uh, difference between uh, this uh, diff uh, this uh, melting region. Okay, lazulite composition can be variable. It can be either here, here, or here. The difference from each of these rocks is uh, the mineralogical. Uh, composition, the, the mineral abundances, okay? But still, all are consistent with lazulite composition because it encompasses within the lazulite triangle, right? But uh, in different regions of the mantle, uh, different melting uh, uh, proportions are there, different melting uh, degrees are there, uh, but still you find a lazulite uh, in most of uh, the areas of the mantle. Right? But you might see uh, uh, OPX proportion is different, olivine proportion is different, clinopyroxene proportion is different, but still within the lazulite composition. But at extreme melting regions, uh, you can expect uh, very orthopyroxene rich rock or olivine rich rock, uh, which you can term Hasbergite or uh, Danite respectively. Okay, these are extreme situations. Uh, for a uh, mantle uh, to be melted. You have another rock type here that's called verlite. Okay, you have another rock that is called verlite. Uh, actually, this verlite uh, uh, is rich in CPX because you know here the CPX 90 degree, 90 uh, proportion, not degree, uh, 90 uh, what you call percentile. Okay. Uh, it's uh, rich in clinopyroxene, but very low in orthopyroxene. See, orthopyroxene, this is 100. Here you have 100. Here you have 50. Here you have uh, 10, right? Almost, sorry, uh, here, 10, right? Clinopyroxene 90, orthopyroxene 10, right? So where light means uh, CPX rich rock, right? Olivine is also there already. Uh, that is also as a result of melting. So that means uh, if you are consuming a lot of orthopyroxene, but not clinopyroxene, but actually mantle, mantle melting does not uh, generate uh, this wear light uh, rock because it's highly unlikely uh, for orthopyroxene to melt without clinopyroxene melting in the mantle region. This happens within the crustal uh, regions. Uh, where uh, you can have a lot of clinopyroxenes instead of orthopyroxenes, but it is not uh, melting, it might be crystallization. Okay, opposite, opposite of uh, melting, right? It's a different phenomena. Uh, you don't have to think much, but for the time being, you, you think, uh, you consider that uh, in the mantle, either you have uh, lazulite uh, or Hasbergite, 
or in a more extreme case, dunite, right? Anyway, these three types of rocks can be found in the mantle, dunite, hasbergite, or lazulite. Those are the three uh, rock types uh, you can find uh, in, uh, in the mantle. Okay, so I hope uh, you could understand uh, up to this level. Because this mantle melting is very, uh, very much uh, complicated. Uh, so uh, there are so many parameters that we have to consider. And we will, of course, uh, learn about uh, melting uh, uh, reactions and uh, the mechanisms. Uh, so many other aspects to learn in the uh, coming, coming uh, <clears throat> classes. Uh, main thing is uh, you have to uh, get familiar with this uh, terminology. Uh, pristine mantle. Pristine mantle means original mantle which has not contributed to any melting. Okay. The initial mantle which is not contributed to any melting. It's a lazulite uh, composition anyway. Right. Because you know the mantle composition is lazulite. Then uh, the already melted mantle which is also lazulite but uh, you can term it as residual mantle because uh, it has already contributed uh, some melt out of it, right? And also one, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention uh, this uh, pristine mantle, uh, which has not contributed to mel melting, uh, you can call fertile mantle as also. Fertile man uh, man mantle, right? Fertile. Fertile means it can contribute melting subsequently. Okay, fertile. So it has the potential to make a melt out of it. It's a fertile mantle. So fertile mantle, when it is subjected to uh, either heating or decompression, it can uh, start partial melting, uh, forming uh, basalt out of it. Right. So this fertile mant mantle can contribute uh, to uh, melting and it will convert into a, uh, a residual mantle, okay? So this residual mantle, when uh, if you uh, keep on melting at uh, continuously, maybe several steps, always remember this does not get melted at once, right? It happens in stage wise, right? Because it's very hard to um, melt because you need a lot of energy. Right, either pressure, dec uh, pressure decrease or heat. Right, it all depends on the aluminium composition also within the mantle. If the aluminium composition is so high, even uh, you decompressed or even you heated, it's very hard uh, for the mantle to melt. That is also there. But I, that's why I, men I mentioned there are so many other parameters also. Anyway. Uh, if you uh, contribute melting uh, step by step, right, continuously, at the time, you might end up with the mantle which has no clinoparaxin at all, right? And also, you might have no or very limited orthopyroxin also. So almost 90% your mantle might be olivine rich, okay? Because uh, in mantle melting, uh, I, I, I mentioned first to melt is CPX, then OPX, then olivine, like that, right? So when these steps are going on uh, at different uh, stages, say 5% uh, melting and then 10% melting, 20%, 30%, or when it comes to about 40%, right? It's almost dunite. The mantle is almost dunite. That means almost all potential melting minerals like CPX and OPX has gone. From the onwards, it's very hard to melt, further melt, right? So uh, we we consider around 40% as the kind of a limit for mantle melting. From there onwards, it's very hard to melt. That's why <clears throat> in the mantle, you never ex experience uh, total melting. Always we experience partial melting only, okay? So when it comes to around 40% of melting, <clears throat> Even uh, you try to melt by either heating or decompression, the mantle might not uh, contribute further melting. Right? I mean, you will not find any basalt produced out of it. Right? That residual mantle is very, very uh, we call refractory. Okay. So 
uh, the the initial mantle we call fertile mantle but the mantle at a certain stage like this you can call highly refractory mantle okay highly highly refractory refractory that means it's very very hard for you to get uh, melt out of it right so what you uh, do during melting is you are increasing the uh, refractoriness of this mantle right in this way right the more you remove the melt the more you make the mantle refractory refractory right not refractive refractory okay so uh, the higher the proportion of olivine or the higher the proportion of uh, opx and olivine both then you can call uh, that particular mantle as refractory mantle but if you have a lot of CPX, even at this stage, this is not refractory because it is still fertile because uh, the presence of CPX. Because CPX can uh, anyway uh, melt. But normally, when it comes to 40% means uh, almost all the CPX has gone. You don't uh, find any CPX remaining there. You are not expected to find uh, because uh, it's too high degree of melting. All right. <clears throat> so this is uh, the uh, about the mantle melting and uh, about uh, it's uh, some basic terminologies okay and uh, remember about uh, this as well this talks about the aluminium bearing phase so that's why i mentioned about the aluminium uh, uh, effect if it is highly aluminous uh, that's very hard for uh, the mantle to be melted also. That's another parameter. But anyway, remember, less than 30 kilometers, you can still have plagioclase also in the mantle. It's possible. Although you don't have plagioclase in this tri triangular diagram, uh, because it's not regarded as a typical uh, mantle mineral, that's why it's not included there. But normally, plagioclase is stable there, right? Up to 30 kilometers light, right? But up to 30 kilometers means almost the crustal depth, right? almost the crustal depth. So uh, beyond the crustal depth, uh, you have, of course, mantle, upper mantle. Uh, some small amount of plagioclase can be still available. So you can't uh, definitely uh, bound, make a boundary as 30 kilometer, but just it's okay. You can just uh, keep it as uh, 30 kilometer. Uh, within the, uh, even within the, uh, the, the profile, okay? So from there onwards, uh, you can have uh, 30 to uh, 80 kilometers like depth. Uh, spinel is available, right? Spinel is an aluminous space. Uh, without aluminum, you can't have a spinel, right? And from there onwards, uh, you can have garnet. Even spinel is not there in the diagram, right? Spinel is not regarded uh, to classify a uh, mantle rock. And also garnet is not regarded as a classification mineral for uh, mantle, right? For mantle classification, we use only olivine, orthopyroxene, and clinopyroxene. But if uh, you have <clears throat> uh, some uh, considerable amount of plagioclase or spinel or garnet, then you can term that particular mantle as uh, plagioclase lazulite, spinel lazulite, or garnet lazulite, like that, right? You can add that term also if that particular mineral is present. If it is not there, then you do, you can just say lazulite, right? Normally, in uh, throughout the mantle, you have spinel uh, up to eighty kilometers, and therefore most of the mantle that uh, mantle material that we uh, encounter are spinel lazulites. So all these triangular region, uh, you will have spinel lazulites, right? But if it is very deep, then you can have garnet lazulites. That means garnet bearing mantle. Okay, just in simple words, garnet bearing mantle. That is very hard to melt actually. If garnet is present within the mantle, uh, it's very hard. Uh, I mean, it's uh, we, we take this plagioclase spinello garnet as like kind of an accessory phases, but if they are present means you need a lot of energy to uh, for the melting to take place, right? So <clears throat> with respect to these uh, uh, minerals, uh, we uh, we take uh, the stability fields in the mantle uh, as uh, plagioclase stability field 
or spinal stability field or garnet stability field, uh, we have uh, different depths in the mantle, right? Uh, we will take uh, into the, I mean, consider them into detail later, uh, not now, okay? So this is the uh, simplest uh, way that I can explain about the composition of the mantle. Uh, so you 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 should keep in mind all these terminologies and uh, because uh, they, they will come up uh, or they will pop up uh, frequently uh, during our discussions in the <clears throat> lectures to come. Okay. So do you have any question?